What a beautiful, natural, no radiation day I'm enjoying today. Entirely. Hello? 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 Buddy, this is Praxis. We all know that there are so many threats that we hear about to our existence on a daily basis, from volcanic eruptions to earthquakes to sea level rise, climate change, aliens invading by air dropping bird flu infected clown zombies, civil war, and so many other different types of threats that we hear about. Some of them are more likely and some are less likely, but one that is just about near 100% likely to happen is the rollout of 5G. Now, the, really, the only question is whether or not it's an actual threat to us. I, there's a lot of information on both sides, and whenever I'm interested in something and I want to learn more about it, instead of going to the rumor mill and listening to like what the doomsayers have to say or listening to the mouthpiece of authority telling us, you know, don't worry, everything's going to be fine, dude. Uh, I like to go to real experts, find out real information so I can make real positive decisions for my own life. And the person that I have tonight that I'm doing an interview with that I want to share with you is Arthur T. Bradley. Arthur T. Bradley is an engineer. He's worked for NASA. He runs to the Disaster Preparer website. Uh, he's a prolific writer and he is kind of my go-to person. Where, whenever I have questions about EMF, electromagnetic spectrum, all that kind of stuff, I go to him. I recently did an interview series with him about EMP electromagnetic pulses. Here's a link to it if you want to check that out. But tonight what we're going to be talking about is 5G. Is it something that we should be concerned about? If it is, how concerned should we be about it? And more importantly, if it is a concern, what do you actually do about it? It's all well and good to get terrified. I mean, this is a fear porn channel. Don't get on that ship! It's a cookbook! It's great to just get terrified of things, but I think what's more useful is to find out what to actually do about that. So first off, thank you, Arthur, so much for being with me tonight. Sure, glad to be on your show. Well, I really appreciate your being here, and I want to start things really simple for people, for people that aren't really even aware of what 5G is. 5G is a type of EMF. Uh, let's talk about what is EMF. Yeah, so it, it actually has a couple different definitions. It stands for electromagnetic fields, at least that's if you ask an engineer, that's what they would say. Um, sometimes you'll see it written as electric magnetic fields, as if there's two different fields. And in fact, there can be. So it's either electromagnetic or electric magnetic fields. Now, 5G is not the only source of EMF. What are some other sources of EMF that people might encounter during their daily lives? Right. So pretty much anything that has electricity in it will generate some type of field. And it, the part that gets tricky, it's very confusing for people, is... There's really two very different regions to think about. There's very low frequency uh, emissions, and those are things that are maybe from your house wires or from external power wires. Anything that's running, you know, the power in our house runs at 60 hertz. That means 60 times a second, it changes direction back and forth, back and forth. And that's our low frequency type things. And anything that runs on that 60 hertz power that goes through your home, is going to ultimately generate some of those low frequency emissions and we'll talk all about what to worry about there and then there's these high frequency emissions which are really electromagnetic they're both electric and magnetic fields coupled together and those are everything from you know your wi-fi to your cell phone smart meters anything that's transmitting uh, data uh, wirelessly through the air those kind of frequencies your microwave oven and things like that and those are much higher frequencies and there's a different sort of threat from those and a different way of measuring them. And so there's these two very different bundles of, of concern when you talk about EMF. And some people don't sort between those two. And so it gets very confusing. 
As a prepper, there is one word that you just said that really made my ears perk up, and that is the word threat. And that's what really people are mostly concerned about with when it comes to 5G. Uh, you know, we all know that human beings have electrical impulses in our bodies. What is the impact of these artificial, you know, synthesized electromagnetic fields upon humans' bodies? Right. So that's a really complicated question that a number of different experts would have to sort of provide their opinion on. But you can think about it this way. Uh, this, this EMF radiation was another term for it. This radiation is often divided into either non-ionizing radiation or ionizing radiation. Now, we all know about ionizing radiation. If you go get an x-ray, that's ionizing radiation. Uh, gamma rays are another example of ionizing radiation. And what that means is that's, that's very energetic radio radiation that can essentially strip electrons off of um, atoms and, and leave them ionized. And so it's called ionizing radiation. And by affecting the cellular structure, the atomic structure, you can cause physical harm and damage to the cells. And we know that because if we get too much of that type of radiation, we get very sick and die. And so that's the ionizing radiation side. Now, everything we're talking about and we're going to talk about tonight is non-ionizing radiation, meaning that it doesn't have those sorts of energies to strip away electrons off of our our atoms and leave us leave with ionized cells and ionized uh, molecules in our body. And so that non-ionizing radiation has very different effects. And so if we just focus on that, the, the question is, no one knows for sure um, what levels are safe, what kind of damage it might cause. There's been a large number of studies on non-ionizing radiation and how it might, let's say, in, increase chances of cancer or cause leukemia. Um, a whole bunch of different studies and many of the results are in complete disagreement with each other. And so it's difficult to say with any authority that a specific level will cause a specific kind of injury over time. What everyone can agree upon, I think, is that if you can have lower amounts of EMF, that's good, right? Because there's no reason to introduce that sort of energy into your body that might cause some potential damage. And it is known that at very high field levels, there is some localized heating of cellular tissue and that's believed to be harmful. So at the very extreme, everybody agrees that yes, if you put too much energy out there, you can cause some cellular effects and that's probably not good for you. But short of that, everybody's in diametric disagreement over what levels are safe and what levels are not safe. And I'll give you an example. Um, if you look at like there was recently, uh, there's a group called IEEE, which is very famous for engineers. And they recently re released a, a report, I think it was just this year, that has a, a chart showing all of the sort of recommended maximum allowances of E fields, electric fields, and magnetic fields. And just at like 60 hertz, it says, you know, maybe the maximum level should be about 2,000 milligauss. Gauss is just a measure of magnetic field. But if you look out at various medical experts, there are people who claim that anything over like a few milligauss is harmful. So, you know, we're talking about three orders of magnitude different in terms of their opinions. Um, and so my message is that it's very difficult to draw a firm, logical, you know, professionally backed up opinion on what is safe and what is not safe. So you have to be real careful about that. Now, would you say that you feel that there just haven't been enough studies to really get a good sense of whether these, uh these fields are going to impact people in a, in a negative way? Or do you feel like there's just so much money in this that the money is clouding the issue? Um, I don't think it's money. I, I mean, there's been a number of independent type studies. That, you know, the big ones that came out originally were worried about power lines, right? And I think we all it's maybe started back in the 70s or something. I remember growing up and hearing about those studies. Um, and the idea was that if you live pretty close to a power line, you're going to generate, you're going to have these very strong electric and magnetic fields that are going to be washing over you all day long, all night long, and that might cause cancer or some other problems. And there were a lot of folks worried that their children were developing cancer because they were living too close to power lines. And when they looked at really broad studies, they found that in fact those correlations didn't exist. Yes, there were a lot of people claim they felt sick when they were near the power lines, but again, how much of that was sort of psychosomatic, you know, you, you feel like you're close to it, so any illness you attribute to that. And so it was very difficult to correlate. Um, I recently, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, was curious, how close to power lines do you have to be to start seeing fairly high magnetic fields? So I got a Gauss meter and went out there with a, with a friend of mine, and we went to three different size um, towers, essentially. The small towers, like at a neighborhood, and then medium-sized towers at a ballpark, and then a really, really large towers out that are sort of in these main corridors. And what we found is that by the time you get between 30 and 50 meters, 
30 meters on the small ones and 50 meters on the very large ones, the, the magnetic field is almost not measurable. You're down to around one milligauss, which is very small. And so it rolls off very, very rapidly from power lines. So if you can stay a safe distance, let's say 50 meters, um, you won't really have any measurable magnetic field uh, that you can measure, same way with electric field. And so what was interesting is they, they form those corridors where it's exactly the closest house is never closer than that 50 meter value. Um, so I don't know if that's by regulation or if that's just by, you know, for some other reasons, but it was interesting that everywhere we went, by the time you got to the back porch of the house, you could no longer detect the magnetic field, even with the best instruments we had. I actually did a lot of my own research when I was looking for land for building a homestead upon, and I found exactly the same thing that you did, where I was taking meter readings, and once you get about 50 yards away from power lines, the, the, the drop-off on the electromagnetic fields was really intense. It was almost nothing after, after 50 yards or so. But let's take a step back. Like, what, what type of uh, radiation are we even talking about when we're talking about 5G? Uh, you know, th there's a whole spectrum there. You know, where does 5G uh, land on that spectrum? Is it ionizing? Is it non-ionizing? Where is it? No, it's non-ionizing, and um, it, you know, 5G is a whole set of bands, and, but you can think of it in the order of from a few gigahertz up to let's say maybe 70 or 80 gigahertz. So it's very broad, and they're going to they're gonna increase those frequencies over time. But so it's in the range, you know, most things that we have nowadays are on the order, remarkably, they're about 2.4 gigahertz, most of the things that we talk about cell phones, microwave ovens, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that run right around those couple of gigahertz. And the early 5Gs might be a little higher than that, but they're not going to be in the 50 gigahertz range yet. And what happens is, so you have this non-ionizing, you know, multi-gigahertz transmissions. Um, and what happens is the higher they go in frequency, the more att natural attenuation you get of those, that, those waves. And so, you know, your trees and your houses and everything else start attenuating that pretty quickly. And unfortunately, what that means is you have to put more transmission points or more antennas to sort of blanket an area, right? If you're trying to keep a city covered with 5G, you have to put antennas everywhere, maybe every 100 meters or so. Um, whereas now you have these large cell towers and you don't get quite the attenuation that you would uh, when you start bumping up into these tens of gigahertz times of things. So that's really where the big concern comes from is that, well, yeah, it's bad enough we have cell towers, you know, every mile or so, but now we're talking about having antennas put, you know, every football field away from us on all these little antennas everywhere and being bathed in that very high frequency uh, energy, people are worried that that might cause some kind of health effects. And you know, I understand that concern. I think it's a reasonable question to ask. So you talked about 5G as being something that's like at a slightly higher frequency than say where cell phones are. Uh, if you keep going up the frequency spectrum, you get to visible light. So it's somewhere in the middle between those two. Uh, you know, it's somewhere where, around where people usually say is uh, kind of like the microwave range where, you know, microwave radiation is. And that brings me to like one fear that some people have that, you know, we all know our microwave ovens are used to, you know, boil water, things of that nature. Uh, you know, some people are concerned that these microwave uh, radiation emissions from 5G are going to like microwave people's brains. Is that something that people really need to be concerned about? Why or why not? Right. No, that's a good question. So just so we get the, the spectrum sort of the feel for it. So microwaves run at 2.45 gigahertz. All of them that I know of run at that frequency. Um, if you talk about visible light, you're talking about between 400 and 700 terahertz. Okay. So way, way, way higher in frequency um, than any kind of like microwave ovens. If you're looking at 5G, let's just for numbers, let's say it's like 30 gigahertz might be where they end up settling, somewhere in that range. So it's an order of magnitude or so higher in frequency than microwave ovens. Now, microwave ovens do in fact can cause boiling water. We know that, We've seen, we use that in fact to our advantage. Um, the interesting thing about 5G, and I'm not a 5G proponent, don't get me wrong, um, but the interesting thing about it is because they move high enough in frequency, um, and it's, it's easily blocked and absorbed um, that it actually won't penetrate the body. Uh, the skin, just the skin layer, which is anywhere from about a half a millimeter to about four millimeters, depending on what part of the body you're on, that's actually thick enough to block the 5G from penetrating into the body. So you won't get brain, for example, brain heating or any effect of the water in your brain or anything like that because the skin on your body will actually absorb and, and prevent that from penetrating. So it's an interesting... A question now whether or not well, that will cause skin cancers or other problems is you know, you know sort of a time will tell kind of thing. 
To what extent are you aware of the nature of a lot of the tests that have been done to you know, check on the safety for humans around this? I know that there have been you know, mouse and lab rat studies on this. Do you know that they, if they've gone beyond that? Or, well, I mean, at the moment, we're, we're starting to see 5G roll out, so I guess we're beginning a massive human experiment in that way. But to what extent do you, are you aware of whether or not there have been much in the way of tests in the, you know, on people in a laboratory setting? You know, how, how confident can we be in the data that people are presenting when they're saying this is safe? Right. I'm not aware of any exhaustive testing. I think they've done some like specific absorption rate, SAR type testing, just to see how the energy couples into human tissue. But there's never been, as far as I know, there's never been any large scale studies or trials to see how it might affect a population. In fact, as you point out, we're essentially starting those trials right now. It sounds like what you're saying is that 5G maybe isn't as terrifying as some of the doomsaying prophecies had suggested that it might be. People's brains aren't gonna instantly microwave. People aren't gonna be turned into automaton zombies you know, within the week. You know, It's not quite to that level. But at the same time, you know, I'm picking up that maybe it's not as safe as people have been suggesting, You know, just based on the lack of you know, a thorough research and lack of, you know, data. Uh, and, you know, this is a prepping channel. People like to kind of, in the prepping community, err on the side of caution. Let's, so let's take it from that uh, sort of angle that this is something that's maybe there's too many questions, uh, question marks around it for us to necessarily feel 100% safe. And for people that don't want their themselves and their families to be part of the, the, the you know, I guess what you call the beta study here about, you know, watching, you know, watching what's going to happen as it rolls out everywhere. If people want to limit their exposure to that uh, wonderful experience, are there things that they can do to kind of insulate themselves from the radiation that's coming out of their devices or coming out of the, uh, the towers themselves? Or, you know, let's just start right there. Where does the radiation in 5G come from? Is it coming from the device in your hand? Is it coming from the tower? Where, where is the, the energy really being emitted from? Yeah, it's coming from both. Um, the, the antennas are going to be all over the place and they're essentially going to be transmitting and receiving this high frequency electromagnetic waves and your cell phone going to have that same operation. It's going to have an antenna that's transmitting and receiving just like they do now. And so you're going to be a source of it and you're going to be receiving it. And uh, there's not much you're going to be able to do about that if you have a 5G cell phone that you're going to be a part of that network. Okay, so presuming that people might want to limit their exposure to electromagnetic energy in their life, uh, you know, and there are all sorts of uh, sources of that, not just 5G, you know, is there a way of them kind of going around and mapping their house to see if there are areas of their house that have more or less of these electromagnetic fields? You know, it's not just emitted from 5G, it comes from, you know, electrical wiring running through the walls, you, you know, computers, everything, this light that's illuminating my face. You know, it comes from all sorts of sources. Uh, is there a way of people sort of mapping their house? Is that something that's accessible to the average person? And if it is, how could they go about doing that? Yeah, so I've been looking at that this uh, summer and fall because it's a good question. And so what I did is I bought, I guess I bought about 15 different EMF meters. And you can go on Amazon and search EMF meters and you'll find all of these different meters ranging from $20 to several hundred dollars. And we set up some very controlled experiments. We used um, devices, let's just leave it at that, that generate known magnetic fields and known electric fields. And then we, we took these devices and we, you know, these, these instruments that we bought and we tried to see which one of them worked well, which did not work well. And I'm afraid to say that almost all of them don't work hardly. They're not even worth the $20 that you'd pay. They'll give you false readings that don't make any sense. Um, and so I can only recommend two, uh, two products in particular that, that seem to be pretty accurate. Um, one of them is, is made by Bell, B-E-L-L, -L, and they make calibrated uh, test and instrument type equipment. So it's no wonder that the product is good. It's in fact the best of the devices for measuring low frequency magnetic fields. So now it's not cheap, it's like $450 or something. It was the most expensive of the products we'd tried. But it's really nice, it's a little handheld unit. You can measure what the magnetic fields are up to a couple of kilohertz. So it'll pick up any of the 60 hertz type magnetic fields that are in your home. And it's a nice product. Now, it won't measure electric fields at all. It only measures magnetic fields. Um, the second product is one called the Tri-Field. Um, and you can find it on Amazon. I don't have any affiliation with either of these companies. Um, but it's a slick little device. It's got a little digital meter that sort of shows on the, on the front of it. And we found that it was actually pretty accurate. Um, I don't think it's quite as accurate as the Bell, but it was it, for the money, we're talking a couple hundred dollars, maybe $180 or something. It, it seemed like a reasonable product. 
um, its only limitation was it had a, a relatively low maximum that it could read. I think it would only read 100 milligauss. Um, so it would sort of peg out when you got into really noisy environments. Um, and it also allowed you to measure high frequency electric fields, it, whereas the Bell did not. But it wasn't particularly accurate. It's very difficult to measure high frequency fields without um, being detached from the probe. You have to sort of set up a system where you're detached and it's very expensive, several thousand dollars for that type of equipment. And so my message would be if people are wanna, they want to survey their home, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. You can look at maybe a bell instrument or maybe one of those tri-field instruments um, and you can just walk around the house and use that meter on the magnetic setting and figure out what in your house is generating magnetic fields. Um, for low frequencies, that's really the thing that most people would worry about is the magnetic fields. And what you'll find is the things that have the most current going to them are the things that are generating the most magnetic fields. And it might at least give you some, you know, some data points to say, well, if I'm worried about that sort of exposure, maybe I should keep a little bit of distance from that particular object. Um, remember, these fields drop off very rapidly, at least one over uh, R squared. They have sort of an inverse squared. So if you can get a meter or two away, the, the fields drop very, very quickly. Um, but those, those inexpensive meters are really great just to get a measure of the magnetic fields in your house. Um, as far as electric fields, you could try that tri-field meter. It gives you some indication, um, but again, I wouldn't really put too much credence in those values. Just, you just really have to have a, a higher quality, expensive instrument to get electric fields at a high frequency. So from your, like your Wi-Fi or your cell phone or, or, your, or your microwave oven, you're not going to get readings from those um, that are very accurate unless you have a quality um, system. And those aren't really accessible for most people. Do you have any advice about what people should do with that information once they gather it? I would imagine that there'd be a lot of people that would be possibly surprised, maybe a little disturbed by how much electromagnetic energy they're finding in their homes. You know, what types of things can people do to limit that? I know from my own experience, uh, you know, there are certain things I do during my daily life, uh, you know, working in front of a computer where I just sort of accept that I'm going to be within that electromagnetic bubble of the computer while I'm working there. There are other things like that as well. But one thing that I do is when I go to sleep at night, there are many of these devices I don't need anymore. For example, the, uh, the wireless internet, uh, uh, you know, it has a bubble all over the house during the waking hours, but I have it on an automatic timer. So at the end of the day, it always shuts off and then it will turn itself back on in the morning. And by doing that, I'm just reducing by one little bit, you know, the amount of electromagnetic energy in the air that is uh, bathing my body while I'm asleep. Uh, do you think that that is good advice? Uh, do, would you have any other, other advice similar to that or completely different? What would you tell people to do if they want to limit this uh, radiation from their lives? Right, no, I think that's great. So shutting things off is probably the best thing you can do, right? Because again, remember, especially with the low frequency fields, it's all about the amount of current that things draw. So if you power them down, those fields essentially go away. Um, not always true for high frequency stuff because sometimes there's things running in the background that are still transmitting and receiving like our cell phones for example. Um, but I think shutting off everything that you can is great. Um, there's a few other things you can do. Remember your biggest, your biggest bang comes from getting away from things. So if you have something, you know, not having your cell phone a foot away from your head while you sleep but instead maybe putting it on a dresser, you know, 10 feet away might be a good idea. Um, things like that, just sort of putting a little distance between you and the sources. There are other options you can do. Some people have they're, they're hypersensitive. There's a particular condition, in fact, a medical condition that some people have where they're hypersensitive to EMF. And they've even done these experiments. A lot of people thought, oh, that's just people's minds. You know, they're just playing games. But they did these blind studies where people went in rooms and they turned on and off various sources and the people could detect it. They could, in a blind study, they could tell them, no, it's on, it's off, I can feel it. Which is really interesting. I don't have that. Most people cannot tell that sort of thing. But those are people that are very sensitive to those type of fields. And they, many of them feel pain from different types of of emissions and so they really have to pay attention to it. I, and, and some of the steps people take that are worried about it in particular, there's a couple of interesting things you can do. You can create a quiet space in your home. You kind of do that by shutting off instruments. But you can also, for example, paint the walls in a particular room of your home with conductive paint. And there's a number of them out. We're going to test, uh, I think, about five of them this fall to see which one works the best. But basically you just put a coat of this conductive paint on and then you cover it with regular paint so you don't even really know it's there. But it acts not quite like a Faraday cage but like a shielding barrier in that room and it helps to significantly reduce the fields from things that are outside the room that might be coming in. And so that conductive paint's an option. There's also things like um, conductive bedding. Some people are worried, well I'm laying here for eight or nine hours and there's a lot of these things going on around me, these EM sources. 
and they buy this sort of uh, conductive bedding where the bedding has metallic fibers sewn into it and it provides some level of shielding as they pull the sheets over their body. It helps to reduce the fields that their body sees. And again, most people, it's probably not, they're not cheap. These sheets are hundreds of dollars. Um, but most people maybe not worth the money to do that. But for some people that are really worried about it or they're hypersensitive, I think those are options they could look at. Well, that's very interesting. Actually, in having visited your website on and off, I feel like I've seen some uh, you know, cloth along the lines of what you were talking about. If this is something that people might like to, to purchase, I know you do a lot of extensive testing on different products. Could they go to your website to pick up something like that? Uh, not at this time they couldn't. I'm really just getting into looking at EMF. Um, I've always looked at EMP and we do have a conductive cloth on my website which is specifically used um, to let's say wrap up electronic items and protect them. It's very similar to this like a sheet that I was talking about but it's not a really soft cotton cloth that you know you'd necessarily want to drape over your body. It's sort of like a coarse uh, almost like a denim type material. So it's not really used in that way um, but there are a number of products out there if somebody wants to go out and look they can search for like EMF bedding and things like that and you'll find it again it's not cheap but it's an option people can look at. Well, thank you very much for your time, Arthur. I really appreciate the way that you actually investigate these things. You go out, you get real data, real information to make real decisions instead of just jumping onto the fear bandwagon. I, I hope that we have possibly uh, calmed some fears of some people uh, on this topic and may, you know, hopefully generated some fears in some people because this, this is a fear porn channel and we gotta, you know, we gotta <laughs> keep that treadmill going. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate uh, your take on this because you have real information from real research that you've done yourself and that's so valuable in a, in a world that just uh, is like an echo chamber where you know one person says something and then everybody else repeats it it's really refreshing to actually be able to go to the real source which is science and testing and the real world and find out what's real about all of this so i appreciate your time very much sure you're most welcome if you guys would like to learn more about this or check out uh you know everything else that arthur's been doing you can go to his website it's disasterpreparer.com there is so much on there one of my favorite things is all of the uh uh, the, the fun sort of, well, it's fun, but also educational uh, fictional material that he has on there. There's a lot on there. I'd highly recommend you check it out. Links are down below on that. Thank you so much for your time watching. I hope that you've learned something. I know I've learned quite a bit, and I think it's going to help me in preparing for, you know, the inevitable rollout of 5G. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.